All right, guys, we're live. We're doing a live stream. Haven't done one of these in a long time. It's been, uh, I guess it's, it's been a minute, right? I think September was the last time I did one of these. But I want to get back into the groove of doing these. This is one of the things that I, I really enjoy doing. And uh, sometimes it's easy to let the, um, the the toils of life get in the way of being able to do them. But I'm trying to rededicate myself to doing it more and more often. So uh, let's do that today. We're going to go over all sorts of stuff today. I got all... All, all sorts of stocks and different indices that I want to look at and, and go over with you guys. Going to go over the markets, SPY, the Q's, IWM, first and foremost. We're going to go over some of the indicators, what we're seeing, the yields. It's really a difficult market right now. I would say the last two months have been some some of the more difficult trading that I've experienced over the last couple of years, just from a uh, the standpoint of um, trying to really just get something to materialize in your favor. And uh, there's been some shorting. There's been going some getting long at times. And uh, some little bit of success, but then there's been some stop outs too. So that, it's been pretty frustrating in that regard. Um, and let me know in the comments what what charts, what stocks you want me to go through. And I'll go through them in chronological order of when I got them. And uh, we'll go through them each and, each and every one of them until we're done with this. But in the meantime, I'll go over, over my charts and what I'm seeing, some different trade setups some opportunities that I see arising. Um, one of the things um, I, I think that's been really frustrating is this whole zero day option expiration trading. I think you saw that today, especially around that noon time period when we were hitting lows and all of a sudden that market just reversed and you're just getting buying upon buying. And what you're essentially getting is people buying options that are expiring the same day and they're trying to goose that market higher. But in the process of getting the market to go higher, the people who are writing those options, they're having to do uh, Delta hedging, which requires them to be, have to buy those shares as the Delta gets higher on those options uh, premiums they have to keep buying more, more and more. So it, it's buying that's begetting buying that's begetting buying and creating more problems or creating more of a buying surge. It's creating its essentially its own ecosystem day in and day out of the market, regardless of what the news is. And that can be kind of a frustrating from a swing trading standpoint. So, hey there, Skyheart. I appreciate you joining me. And man, Skyheart, he, he, he loves the videos. He watches the videos a lot. And I always appreciate him uh, jumping into these live streams as well. It's been a while. Um, so thank you for jumping in there today with, with me there. What I want to go ahead and do now is jump into the SPY. I'm going to go over that one here right out of the gate. So I was actually long on SH, which is the inverse one-to-one -one ETF of SPY. And I was also long on PSQ, which is the inverse ETF one-to-one -one of the NASDAQ today. Closed out both of them today. Very frustrated that I did too. I I didn't like having to do that. That that really annoyed me. But uh, you know, most of the time when I'm when I'm getting out of a trade, I don't enjoy getting out of it. But there was there was too much concern there for me to go ahead and hold it overnight. I said to myself, you know what? If I am wrong on it, I can always get back in. And you can see I've got a whole bunch of markings on this chart. Let's go ahead and get rid of some of them here right out of the gate. Um, so one of one of the things that so we had the bull flag here, by the way, these yellow lines here. That really did not come to fruition, but the, the game's not over for the bulls necessarily because this pullback, and this is what concerned me the most, this pullback to the 50-day moving average and the converging rising uptrend, this purple line, that held today and it held yesterday and it gives me a little bit of pause. And then you have that hammer candle right off of it from a candle standpoint, and that's where you have a long lower shadow and a thin uh, body on top. So that's a big problem there. So it... it, it creates a possibility that we're going to get a bounce here in the short term. And if that's the case, you could see another three to 4% move that takes us right back up to 418. I don't necessarily want to hold a short position through that, through, through all of that. So I went ahead and got out of the position today. I was a little frustrated because I didn't really make too much off of it. I was at one point, I think on SH, because I'd only been in it for a few days. I was up like 1% on the NASDAQ. I was up uh, 2% on that PSQ trade. And I think I got out for uh, under 1% on each of them. So I gave up some of the gains, but um, I feel like I managed to trade fine. But though I didn't want to, I got out of these trades today. So I'm 100% cash again in my swing trading portfolio, knowing that, okay, if the PCE comes in tomorrow hot, and the market sells off, which is a big question mark, even if it's a hot number, we may not get we may not get a sell-off. I mean, look at what we did with the CPI number. We rallied. Look at what we did with the retail number. We rallied. It wasn't until Thursday or Friday last week uh, that we saw those two days result in down days, starting with the PPI indicator that came out. So 
you know, just because we get a bad number tomorrow doesn't necessarily mean that that we're going to uh, sell off. If we do, I can get back into uh, PSQ because I mean, look, PSQ. There's no reason why I can't get back into it if the market uh, sells off tomorrow. Same thing with SH. But for now, I didn't. I couldn't justify holding those positions overnight. So with PS um, Spy. You got that rising trend line. That's the big problem at the moment for the bears, for the bulls. It gives you a little bit of opportunity. Hope that maybe we're about to see a short-term bounce out of the market here. And if so, there is some opportunities there. We'll get to those in just a second. Some stocks that I'll be watching. There's also cues. So we've talked about this double top and a number or double bottom in a number of the videos here. This double bottom, it goes all the way back to October. We didn't have that breakthrough, the um um we didn't have that higher low really in the queues like what we saw in spy for instance spy had a much bigger higher low Queues never got that it just basically had a double bottom but then we rallied off of it we broke that rise in trend line so we can go ahead and get rid of that that has no more importance but then we got this huge support level that come from the double bottom we've had a pullback to it so then you could see this move that takes us from 294 all the way back up to 313 and when you look at like what would happen with NVIDIA today, that was a, the main reason for the, the market rally today really was NVIDIA. It's up 14%. It represents about 4% of the NASDAQ 100. That's a significant impact to the ETF, especially when it can also corral the, uh, the other um, semiconductor stocks. And then the semiconductor ETF, it was up 3.5%. That's going to have a huge weight, weight on the NASDAQ 100. And that's the reason why the market rallied like it did today. NVIDIA never really buckled, and when it didn't buckle, the bulls came back in at around lunchtime and drove that market back up. So it's frustrating. Um, let's look at, um, we talked about SPY, we talked about the Qs. Let's look at IWM here. IWM, a little bit interesting as well. It has the higher low like SPY does. That trend line was broken, so we can get rid of that. But it's not really held on to the short-term support level as well. So that one, that's something to keep in mind going forward. The VIX, it's perking up some, but is it necessarily breaking out? I mean, after today, it kind of puts that in question because you had this breakout, you had this inverse head and shoulders pattern on the VIX, this left shoulder, the head, and then this right shoulder, and you had the breakout. Things were looking pretty good until yesterday, and then it started fading, and then we followed through to the downside again. So are we just going right back down to the 18s? After a 15% move, it's possible if that, if that trend line on the SPY holds, VIX will probably continue to sink lower. Um, and yeah, I'm seeing all y'all's stuff here. So we're going to knock all those out, man. I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, let's see, VIX, another stuff, some other stuff that I want to look at here too. And this will, let's see here. I saw the question. Oh, from Marcus here. It said, let me put my head up a little bit higher here. So I'm not blocking myself. It says, it says, what is your take on the inverted curve potentially leading to a recession? I'm kind of skipping around here on the questions, but I can do that because we're talking about the yields right now. I think ultimately we are going to recession. It's very, you can't, how do you have a recession? Or how do you, how do you tame inflation when you have retail sales surging, when you have hiring surging, when you have the claims at lows, jobless claims at lows? How do you have a, how do you, how do you tame recession or inflation that way? You don't. So you have to have a recession. It's not going to happen. They talk about this no landing now. We went from hard landing to soft landing to no landing. You get a no landing, it's basically just a, uh, a delayed hard landing, right? I mean, I don't see where you get a soft landing in this economy. I really don't. I've, I've never seen it actually happen before. So 10-year, this is the 10-year yield, okay? We, we pulled back the last two days, but you can still see this, this trend line is still very much intact. I mean, it hasn't, this hasn't gone anywhere yet. So um that trend line is right there right in tech you can also go to the two-year the two-year yield that one's broken out it was actually a little bit higher today nonetheless it's right there at the recent highs from november i think it'll probably take out four percent here in the very near or not four percent but um uh, go up to five percent here in the very near future and then you got the 10-year this is the one i was meaning about the four percent um, and we just covered this, but I want to go ahead and go right back to it here again. I swear, trying to navigate my way through uh, the uh, trading view 
it's always frustrating because it's like the exact opposite controls of TC2000. But uh, for, we're at 3.89% there. I think we're going to get to 4% in the very near future. I don't see that not happening. And I think that's going to put a lot of pressure on, on stocks. And then you got your 30 year. Breaking out, man. Decline trend line off of the October highs. That's been broken. So I would think that this would get back up towards the 4.4 to 4.5. We've let financial conditions ease incredibly because the Fed really won't take a stand. They, they do one thing when they're hiking rates and then they do another thing when they start talking, especially Jerome Powell. In fact, he boldface lied on his uh, FOMC match. If you go back to his presser, he said that, hey, I'm not worried about the easing of financial conditions. And then you read the FOMC minutes. He's very much concerned about the easing of financial conditions. So he's really just trying to manage the S&P 500. He's trying to control the market reactions here. And that's very frustrating um, because you really want legit markets. And when you get you get the uh, Fed just intervening and saying crap, that's not true. That's kind of frustrating. Um, moonshot. You're 100% cash at the moment. Join the club. I am too on my swing trading account. I want to get back into it tomorrow. We'll have to see. We'll have to see how the market, uh, if it gives me the opportunity. I feel like the opportunities over the past year have been few and far between and having to wait for those opportunities. When those opportunities come, they typically have been pretty good. Last couple months, they've been a little iffy, but um, so Moonshot's also looking to get short around quarter one. All right. I mean, it's quarter one right now, but uh, you know, I'm... I'm giving it my best here. Yeah, PCEs tomorrow. Don't forget about that. That's a big one. That Fed watches that one very, very closely. That means a lot to them and their decision making. I think right now, I didn't check it at before I came on, but I know that this morning, I think we're at 27% chance. That's probably changed. It's probably gone down to like 22 or 23% now. But I think there was a 27% chance of a rate hike of 50 basis points. Uh, going into next meeting. So it's definitely climbed because I think just a couple of weeks ago, we were sitting at like 9% chance. Plunge protection team has been at work to protect from a plunge. It makes sense for them to defend the current support. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely looks like the Fed's trying to manage the S&P 500 when you're seeing them say things that are definitely contradictory versus what they were just talking about minutes before in a meeting or before they released the FOMC statement. And then they come out and say the exact opposite stuff. It's crazy. All right, let's look at Apple here for Skyheart. So with Apple, the rising uptrend, that's been broken, okay? So we can go ahead and delete that. We don't really need that. Then you broke below the lows from February 10th. I thought, okay, maybe that's a short-term top that we're looking at here. But the, the bounce today has been pretty hard. It's stuck between the 200 and it's stuck between the 20-day uh, moving average. So one of these things are going to break. 200-day um, moving average of that bounce over the last two days has been pretty impressive. But if it bounces here, where, what are you really looking for? Are you looking for it to break out of this range here? If not, then you're just looking at maybe a move to 155, 156. You also have this huge, huge declining trend line or layer of resistance that goes all the way back to January of 2022. We have not been able to break through this for Apple yet. If it did break through it, that would be massive, okay? But it's it's going to be doing that against some, the, you know, bucking some big time market trends if it does do that. Um, 168 is about where that would be at right now. So at the most, from a reward risk ratio, I think there's about $19 of upside. That's a little bit more than 10%. So you're talking about maybe 12, 13% upside. Uh, short to the short side, probably putting my stop loss below the lows from... Um, February 1st, so like 141.32. Um, I still wouldn't rule out either the potential for this little channel, and it's, it's kind of starting to look like we're in this massive channel. I've never actually um, drawn this too much in, in my analysis, and I just started noticing it today. But man, that's a pretty, pretty good channel that Apple's been trading in. So you go all the way back to late 2021, it's just been steadily drifting lower. Um, I could see where we could go all the way back up to 168 and then all of a sudden the stocks, they start to like reprice in the, 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 the reality that a recession is probably right around the corner and we come back down to this 120 level. Coming from Moonshot, quarter four earnings were weak considering it's the best quarter that's the elephant in the room. Yeah, the, the quarter four earnings were, were horrendous. I mean, there was a lot of negative revisions. Market just chewed it up and spit it out, man. It was uh, It was 
quite phenomenal. And people are like, oh, but it beat analyst expectations. When is the analyst ever getting anything right? They never get anything right. Rarely do the analysts get something right. I mean, look how bad they've been on job reports, on GDP, on CPI. They don't get anything right. They're, they're like the most worthless group of individuals in, on Wall Street. And of course, we get the Dogecoin freaks that want want me to uh, promote their their websites on the comments. But um, Skyheart's right about JP being a disaster. Let's see, U and G. I'm not sure what Three Kings Media is st- talking about. It's still at 27, percent but uh, follow up with me there, and I'll I'll address it. Alvaro. Artaza, Artaza, did I say that right? I'm not sure. Uh, what about UNG? Can you give us a clue? It could be a good short-term bull. So a lot of people have been trying to get into um, oil. I'd say, I mean, I would not be trying to jump into these these natural gas plays that are 3X. I mean, that that's some pretty crazy stuff there. Yeah, I mean, it made a good move today, but there's a lot of people losing on these things. Just look at what it's done long-term. I mean, they have to complete continue to reverse split this thing just to make it have a decent share price probably will be doing it again at some point in the near future but uh i mean over time it's a bad investment trying to do uh, a boil i mean not saying that's what you're doing maybe you are maybe you aren't but a lot of people do do that so i just want to give that as a word of warning i mean even ung is really bad um so it was up about six percent today but really still at this point you're trying to catch a falling knife i mean a lot of people were starting to pile into it when we were testing these lows right here and now we're trading slightly below those lows um and so i still think i mean lots of volume pouring in but i think you're still trying to catch a falling knife i don't have to catch the bottom of a trade i don't think anybody should try to make the aim of trying to catch the bottom of the trade i think really what you want to do is try to wait for a base to form some kind of bullish pattern say okay maybe it's finally starting to turn the corner like when you go back to the cues right Look at the cues. What did we get here? And this is a uh, this is a weekly chart, but you got a nice. I mean, following this huge sell off, you got a nice little double bottom breakout that people played and and did uh, fairly well with it. Um, maybe it's still in play here too, based off of what we're seeing today. But um, you don't really have that yet with UNG. So when you're looking at it from the the weekly chart here, this five week uh, moving average is one of the shortest moving averages you can have. It hasn't even broken above that yet. It has yet to show since December that it can trade up. Actually. Yeah, since this, what, November? November that it can trade above the five-week moving average. And the last time I was doing that, it was trading at 23. Now it's at eight. So it's lost, you know, two-thirds of its value in a short period of time. I would wait for a base to form. So if if the base forms and this thing does start a new bull market for natural gas, well, you know, if, if you get in a right 10 or $11 instead of $8, I mean, does and it goes up to thirty-five dollars. You're still making a pretty good profit right there, but right now it still feels like a falling knife scenario. I mean, it just continues to sell off, and that's been that way. To me, it feels like it's been that way for forever. I mean, going back to, I mean, look, I mean, going back to two thousand eight, it just it never really bounces. Yes, moonshot. Nvidia is trading at multiple crazy crazy PE right now. Um, don't don't go shorting stocks that are, are going crazy like that. I mean, I mean, people have done it with Tesla. They lost their hides on it back in the day. NVIDIA has kind of got that, that crazy in its eyes. It's like a 10 crazy right now with the 14% run higher uh, today. I wouldn't, I wouldn't short it at all. I mean, let me pull this thing up and just talk about it a little bit, but this is a massive gap that it's formed. Meta did it similar similar gap higher and and since then it's just been trading inside that uh, inside the gap i mean it's just been floating lower i would not be surprised if that's exactly what nvidia did going forward where this is like the peak and it just starts to drift a little bit lower to the sideways but you don't know that and so trying to short it but maybe it opens up another five or six percent uh higher tomorrow and it runs another ten percent higher it's very possible i mean look at what the stock has done since the beginning of the year running from like 140 to 240. That's nothing that I want to be trying to short right now. It's tempting. I get it. I do get it. But it's it's definitely not for me. Let's see here. 
Alpha, 25 watching, only five likes. Hey, look, if there was one person showing up, that's who that's who I would be preaching to as well. Let's see. Alex Ramirez. Looks like it broke out of that 9150. And for I haven't done one of these in a long time. So I'm not expecting, you know, hordes of people to, to show up either. So um, but you gotta start somewhere. Alex Ramirez, Google, looks like it broke that 9150 line. So Google right now, what where I'm watching right there is this rising trend line off the November lows. When you look at some of my other markings of it here, you still have this declining trend line going all the way back to the February highs. You also have this massive blue line right here. This goes all the way back to early 2020 where it's held that support level. So if we're drawing that on this other chart here, let me pull up the weekly to, to make it a little bit easier. Right around here. See that there? It's a pretty significant support level. It's been played quite a bit here in recent months. You can see it's bounced twice off of it. On the weekly, it seems like we're going right back down to it. Ah, yeah. Okay. Sorry about that, Three Kings Beat. My mind is... Uh... Sometimes get an order, you, you forget sometimes just what you said five minutes ago. But um, yeah, it's it's about 27% for it's it's not likely at this point that that's what they're going to do. But watch that number, because if it starts creeping up, they talk a lot about not wanting to surprise the market. They talk about wanting to, um, to essentially um, not create any surprises that would cause a sharp sell off. That's they're trying to manage the market, essentially. So but if you start seeing that creep up to maybe like. 50 to 60 percent area then you're starting to look at okay the, the surprise would be to only do it 25 basis points so maybe they will do it at 50 once it start that expectation gets to to be in, uh better than not moonshot likes the oil stocks huh let's look at some energy so we got this double top right here in play um it hasn't been energy has not been the play so far this year but you got that double top. You got some resistance overhead. I don't even know if that's really worth worried about at this moment in time. But that double top is really what I'm watching there. You're looking at stocks like CVX already confirmed that double top right there. So some heavy, heavy moves to the downside for the energy stocks. I'm not ready to jump quite into them yet until kind of like with UNG. You want to see a little bit of a bullish pattern form. Right now, I'm not seeing that with CVX. Precious metals, five-year chart of gold and silver shows a series of lower highs and lower lows. A lot of people think that going into the precious metals will save them in an inflationary period, but it really doesn't work out as good as you expect, um, from my experience at least. And especially when people will try to equate with a, a bull market in gold and silver when you're in a recession. And most from every time, every time I've been in a recession, every time I've seen it, it, it goes right down with the market. So it's usually uh, <laughs> trading gold in a recession is usually like fool's gold so but you're right though i mean you got you got peaks here um of, of it going lower here over time and it's really just been range bound yes like i said you know you had um some pretty nasty sells like 2008 this was your sell-off in 2008 during that recession and then uh 2020 we had a nasty sell-off right there but it's really just a lot of people get caught up in the long-term benefits of it i don't want anything to do with gold or silver from a long-term standpoint Let's see here. SQ block up 4% after hours. I have some of that in my long-term portfolio, actually. but uh, So it's always nice to see you do something good. Uh, let's see. SQ, when you're looking at this chart here, you got this nice base breakout. or Yeah, base breakout back in January breaks out, but then it's pulled back to this base level here so this is another setup okay if the market's going to bounce here maybe sq benefits from it my stop loss would essentially be anything below this uh uh base breakout so if it goes back down below it let's say like 7140 i don't think i'd want anything to do with it at that point in time um but yeah sq looks pretty good nice base nice pull back to that base level maybe it bounces here bottle pulled the rug on you man Yeah, Baba, 
that's that's been I would say all of the Chinese stocks are, are stocks that I'm not willing to trade right now. I, I think that there's just so much uncertainty with that that country and and then the news that they make and then it, it creates just havoc on like JD, Baba, Baidu. Um, they just really seem to, to to cause problems. Now it does have a history with this 200 day moving average. You can see here over the last couple of days. You can see it back in December. You can see it here back in July. It does have a history with the 200 day moving average. So this is a key moment here. Can it bounce off of that level? And if it does, it could barring any bad news because we know that stock you know loves to pull the rug per se on on traders a lot with the bad news baba could be a bounce play off of that 200. and we got mario say have you ever combined technical analysis with options like cash secure puts cover calls what are your thoughts on that i've done some cover calls i don't mind it uh i <laughs> I think a lot of times when I do the cover calls, it always always seems to make a major rally every time I do one of those. But uh, I do like them, though. I mean, I've I've had some stocks I've done plenty of cover calls on over the years, and I've done done really well with them. But it always does stink when you get um, uh, called on your on your on the underlying assets. But I don't do a lot of options in general. One of the reasons why, and I don't I don't use technical analysis on them. There's a lot more variables that you're introducing to the picture. You're, one of the biggest ones being time, and then the value of the premiums that of what you're paying for those options contracts. They all come into play, and it can create a lot more variables than simply trading off a of price and volume. And so you can be right about it, but be in the wrong time frame, or you can be right about it, but you paid too much for the options contract. And so it's very. I don't think it's as as good of a a vehicle for making long term profits as simply just buying the stocks. All right, so some of the stocks that I'm actually looking at here. Let's look at some here. AMAT, A-M-A-T. Look at this little rising trend line here. That's a semiconductors play. It went up about 2%. It didn't really participate all that much in the NVIDIA news, though it certainly did uh, help it to some degree. There is some resistance right here that um, might be worth paying attention to, but it broke above, it broke below it. So I don't think that it that that it's offering up that much resistance at this point, considering how many times uh, it's broken, broken above and below it. So right now I'm looking to possibly play amat off of that rising trend line then you got nee why do i bring this one up because around the 70 dollar level this thing consistently bounces it's at 72 right now but you just go back in time i mean this is going all the way back to gosh how far back are we going this is a major level of support going all the way back to 2020 and it's consistently bounced off of that level so if it gets back down to the 70 dollar level utilities they tend to be a little bit more of a safer play and a uh, bad market uh than than your growth sectors like technology or discretionary. And then you got Microsoft. Why the heck would I be talking about Microsoft here? Microsoft has this little short-term rising trend line off of the January lows. That's a possible bounce play right there as well. We're starting to see a theme where there's a lot of pullbacks to key support levels. AA, another one. Look at this guy. See that? Rising support, um, rising trend line off of the what September lows. Testing it here today. So far, so good. And then Peloton. I hate even bringing up this stock, guys. Literally hate it. Um, mainly because I don't have a lot of confidence in the company long term. But swing trading allows you to take advantage of some short term swings. Now, it was down 2.6%. That's, that's somewhat of a red flag right there today, considering that the market was up pretty well. But it's pulled back to the support level and held it so far pretty good. So now I'm just wanting to see, does it actually bounce? Can it break above yesterday's highs? of the day and if so that could um make things pretty interesting there i'm glad to be back doing some of these alpha i appreciate you coming back but that you didn't forget about me and um according to uh, so moonshot asks you're as you're bearish are you completely out of the market for now what are you waiting for to go long or to go short i give I could see myself going either way tomorrow. If I get long tomorrow, it's going to be very, very short term. It's not like, oh, the bottom's in. I'm, I'm wanting to get jump right back into this market now. It's going to be more so because there is a um, opportunity to get um, maybe a little bit of profit to the long side there. To get short, I really just need to see more of a continuation of what we've seen from Thursday and Friday. And then I'll jump back into probably PSQ and SH and and I uh, could even get into like... Um, a, a one-to-one -one ETF short on IWM, but it, I just need to see it. That pullback on SPY today to that rising trend line, that was a big concern there. I need to see that break tomorrow. And, and if it does do that, then that gives me a little bit more confidence about reinserting myself in the market to the downside. But 
I wanted to hold on to those two positions today. I really did. I had a little bit of profits in them still. But as I was looking at the charts, I'm like, what am I holding on to this for at this point? I'm looking at this rising trend line holding on the SPY. I'm looking at it on the 50-day moving average. That's also holding. I'm looking at the pullback to the double bottom on the Qs. That's holding as well. I can't really justify uh, holding this this um, these two positions anymore. And it kind of pained me to do it. I think, like I said earlier, I hate getting out of all my trades. Um, it always annoys me. But I know that's part of being disciplined as a trader, and we got to do that. So, guys. Make sure to uh, like this video if you haven't done so already, just like what uh, Alpha was talking about earlier. It does uh, mean a lot. It does help me out a lot, too. And I want to get back to doing these on a regular basis. I do like talking with you guys. It's always a, one of the highlights of my week. And um, let me know in the comments if you guys have any other questions. I'd be glad to answer them. Make sure to, uh, if you haven't done so yet, subscribe to the channel. So, all right, guys. Take care. God bless.